Hi, I'm Dr. Michael Haley, show host for the Dr. Haley Show podcast and owner of HaleyNutrition.com. We've done some podcasts over the past couple of years, but never with this particular focus when it comes to gut health, because quite frankly, I've never found someone that had so much knowledge and experience and expertise in this particular area. Today's guest is Dr. Michael Biamonte. He's the founder of the Biamonte Center for Clinical Nutrition in New York, and he's co-creator of a cybernetics platform used to help diagnose and uh, focus a treatment for people with this particular issue. He has a doctorate and he's certified in clinical nutrition in New York and author of the Candida Chronicles. His bio is quite extensive and I can sit here and take up all kinds of time going into some of the details of his training and how he became to be who he is now. But instead, let's get to the show. Dr. Michael Biamonte. Yes, sir. I am honored to have you on my show. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Really, my pleasure. You know, in um, learning about you and, and reading some of your content and listening to some of your podcasts, you have so much knowledge. I'm curious, how did you get like that? I know how I got like that. But I'm, I want to go way back. Where'd you grow up and what kind of foods did you eat? And how did that impact who you are today? Well, I don't really think that had that much to do with this um, because I've been this way for millions of years and I haven't changed. <laughs> but um, I was to answer your question, I was born in Valley Stream. Actually, that's not true. I was born in Queens in Woodside. And my family moved to Valley Stream and we were an Italian family. So that means that most of the family all lived within six blocks of each other. So I lived in a pretty close knit, had a pretty close knit family. And a, uh, even though they were, for the most part, white collar, a lot of them were um, uh, musicians. But they didn't make a living with music. They had regular day jobs, as we would say. But yeah. they were all very musical, very artistic. And um, they were all very curious. The one thing about my family, I could say, is that they never, they didn't have a closed mind or a myopic mind. So I grew up around that. And that that helped shape me a lot. Also, being in the music industry early helped shape me a lot. Because I got to see some of the depravity that was there, which is which is why I'm, I'm not a professional musician anymore. Yeah. At one time, I went to college. I have a degree in music. I studied classical guitar in college. I studied with some of the top jazz guitarists in, in the field. Um, and I made a living playing rock guitar and playing in pubs and playing and playing concerts and teaching kids how to play like Jimi Hendrix. And and I just saw the, the depravity that I saw in the right. music industry got me out of there quick. Right, right. It got yeah. me out of there quick. And but it got it gave me a perspective of, of how the other half lives, so to speak, because we didn't have that going on in my family. Yeah, but you know, it's it's funny because even when you go down to the base, like you talked about starting with the classical guitar, uh, which is, you know, the nylon strings and you're, you know, you're using all ten fingers, you're not holding the pick and strumming. Yeah. And it's a technical way exactly. of playing guitar and that's still how your mind thinks and no think and and actually you just you just hit on something i studied with dom manassi who's most people don't know who he is but he's um he's he's a, a jazz guitarist who in within his own circle or field is highly highly regarded and fr from a technical viewpoint and from a, a viewpoint of music theory he's the highly advanced jazz theory for those of you who've heard of john coltrane Don Manassi, as a guitarist, took John Coltrane's music apart and was able to interpret it step by step down to the very minute fractions of everything Coltrane did. So by the time I got to college, I had, from, from studying with him for so many years, I had such a, a high technical knowledge of music theory and music harmony from a jazz side so when I got into college and I was looking at it from a classical side, it was very easy to understand, very easy. And I would, uh, I had like instances with my teachers in school where I totally blew them away. And some of them, a few of them wanted to take lessons from me to understand how this, how jazz theory would work and how I, to, to gain the perspective that I had. So that uh, that's, that's part of 
Oh, I think that's really maybe hitting into your original question, because from studying jazz theory and then from studying classical theory, I got sort of a, a, a mathematical but yet an aesthetic look at how things work in the universe. Yeah, I took the long road myself. Um, you know, when I grew up, I picked up these wooden chunks and I started swinging them at things and they eventually went along to music. They didn't quite make music. And mm -hmm. I didn't learn how to break it down and actually be the musician until, well, you know, I would say even in recent years, I, I still play the drums um, in the church on a regular basis. Oh, wow. And now I'm learning to break it down and, you know, actually put it on paper and learn what I'm doing. Some of the things that I did along to the music and learning how to right. play without music and actually make music with the drum set instead of just swinging wood at things that would make banging noises makes sense to me yeah i got it <laughs> but it's a lot of fun and uh, this morning when i was walking around the block with my wife we we talked about uh a particular musician and how that typically even for some of the best musicians doesn't pay the bills it's mm. a it's a rough road for a way to make a living my classical guitar teacher Stan solo who um studied with Alfred Valdez Blaines, who studied with Andre Segovia. So he was third generation down. He used to always tell me he, he was a jazz musician his whole life until he started to study classical guitar and then got the jobs in um, Nassau Community College and then in Queens College as the, as the classical guitar teacher there. He told me, and also Hofstra University, he told me to make a living as a musician was a true success. That that's if you could make a living as a musician, you were a true success. You've made it. <laughs> Forget about being on billboards and all that, because that's just a lot of hype. And that's that's not so much always your skill. A lot of times it's it's um your marketing. Yeah. Like as an example, um, with the, the day that my guitar teacher, Dom Manassi, signed his contract with Blue Note Records. Several other very prominent gu uh, guitarists signed on the same day. But they decided because Dom didn't sing and these other fellows did that they were going to push them more because they would be more um, acceptable through the media because they sang. So, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I get it and I understand. And, you know, you're probably missing on some serious talent if you have that view. Well, yeah, well, I also yeah. relate to the Italian upbringing because, you know, for me, what did we eat? Um, a lot of bread, a lot of pasta, a lot of gluten. And I think my body has become immune to it. A lot of people think uh, gluten is the devil. Uh, we've had so much growing up, we could probably snort lines of gluten and not sneeze. Well, the that's, the Italian, that's the Italian American. Like the true, luckily for me, my half of my family were Sicilian. So they more stuck to a more traditional diet that they brought over. So, because if you go to Italy, a, a bowl of pasta is not what what it is here. Here, in if you go to Brooklyn and you go to a restaurant, a bowl of pasta is this huge thing. When you go to Italy, you see like Stanley Tucci when he did his show Searching for Italy. That when they have pasta, it is truly a small dish. That's mm -hmm. instead of antipasta means instead of pasta and it's a small dish that it's more or less introducing it's a prelude to the rest of the meal it's not this you know gigantic thing but the other thing i would say too is that my patients who go to italy who have candida when they go to italy they can eat things in italy that if they ate them here they'd be in bed for three weeks with symptoms because in italy everything is non-gmo and it's all organic they don't wow. know they don't know what GMO is over there. And they don't they have no idea what you're talking about. Wow. If you, if you say where I had a patient once who was in this cafe in um in Italy and he was telling the waiter, This is the most delicious thing I ever ate in my life. Where how do you do this? And he goes, Well, you see that hill over there? We go there in the morning, we pick them back i slice them i put them on the dish salt and pepper a little olive oil and garlic and then i bring it out to you and that's it so it's real food actually <laughs> yeah um that that's amazing i i love it i've never been there and you know i can think of my uh grandmother from sicily and you're right the dinners that she prepared weren't a lot of pasta in fact it was more like um you know stuffed cabbage and you know yeah, it's a lot of vegetables yeah, yeah, yeah. 
but plenty of the, you know, homemade red sauces and uh, white sauces and, you know, lots of, it was, it was Italian. It was good. Or Sicilian. It's, 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 it's amazing how diverse Italy is. I didn't really appreciate it until I watched Stanley Tucci's uh, series about searching for Italy because every, every part of Italy he went to, the food was so different. It was so diverse depending on that region, what they had to offer the, their culture. It was, if anyone hasn't seen it, it's on demand, CNN on demand, Stanley Tucci's searching for Italy. It's an incredible series. Wow. Sounds neat. I'll have to make a note of that and look it up. And if I find it even below this podcast, we'll put a link to it for giggles. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Sounds good to me. You know, it, it's funny because, um, you know, today, I, obviously I want to talk about Candida. Um, but one of the things you mentioned already was GMOs and no GMOs being there in, in Italy. Well, I don't think people realize that Candida, which can be caused by antibiotics, mm -hmm. but some people get Candida and don't take antibiotics. So how did yeah. they People are always it? asking. People are always asking me that. There are some... People who are genetically more prone to candida, there were I there are specific SNPs that make people prone to candida. I have the whole listing of those in my book, the Candida Chronicles. So that's a possibility. But there are other drugs also. Candida is still mostly iatrogenic; it's still drug induced. Antacids will cause candida because antacids stop your stomach acid that affects the pH of your flora. Prednisone, cortisone, estrogen medications will cause candida because those medications increase the amount of glucose circulating in your little blood vessels that the candida sort of taps into. So there are other medications and other things that will cause candida, even swimming pools. If someone is a swimmer and they start drinking too much chlorinated water, that will disturb your flora. It really boils down to anything that could disturb your intestinal flora will cause candida. And yeah. well, antibiotics are a prime suspect, but there are other things that could do that too. But it is also possible genetic. If you, if the person unfortunately has bad genetics and they have those genes that predispose you to candida, if they do the sad American diet, standard American diet, we call it sad. If they do that diet with all the GM and GMO foods, that the non-organic foods, all the fast food, the junk food, they could easily get candida just in that right. Yeah, and I think the foods are also kind of filled with um, a, forms of antibiotics in themselves. Yeah. For instance, you mentioned drinking the pool water. Mm -hmm. uh, chlorine is against life. It's in the water as an right. antibiotic in the water. Right. And, and for a lot of us, you know, we measure pool water in parts per million, and we might keep a balance between three and five parts per million. You might approach close to that in your tap water if you're not drinking filtered water. That's very true. Now, my pool to see is salt water. I have a salt water pool, which isn't really that much more expensive than, a, than the, the regular pool. But that's how you get around it in case somebody is wondering, well, how do I get around the chlorine? Get a salt water pool. Um, but even the but, meat but it's a form eat. of chlorine, even with the salt, though, right? Because you're there's a the there's a minor there's a minor amount of chlorine in the salt water pools. Minor compared to you can tell immediately when we got our our salt water system installed, and I went in the first time, I could tell immediately the chlorine level was like eighty percent, ninety percent less. Yeah. But yeah, even yeah, like he, if, if if you look at food that we eat, um, huge problem is is animal protein because the the, the foods. Well, the best book on this is Animal Factory, um, because he goes through in Animal Factory the horror of how chickens and and supermarket meat is really produced. David Kirby really let it rip in this book. But if you you have chickens that are stored one on top of each other, defecating on each other, being fed arsenic as a as an antimicrobial, you have all the cattle that um, are being fed corn. And again, they're stacked one on top of each other, and they have a special guy who goes in there with this long glove who sticks his, his arm up the butt of the animal to get the corn that the animal can't fully digest out so they're not constipated. I mean, it's just horrible, not to mm -hmm. mention the hormones and the antibiotics that these animals are injected with. People ask me all the time, if you could give somebody simple advice, health advice, what would it be? The simplest thing they could do, eat non-GMO, Eat organic and don't eat animal protein, which is not wild-fed 
gra- you know, you only eat grass fed meat, only yeah. eat wild fed, uh, wild caught salmon, things of this nature. Just don't eat the what we would call standard production food that you find in the supermarket because that's what's killing people. Yeah, you know, I I like what uh, Jordan Rubin had said. He said, "You've heard it well said that you are what you eat." But yeah. I say when it comes to animal foods, you are what they ate. Yeah, that's right. It's correct. And it's correct. And another another pun along this, not pun, but another thought along this line. Uh, are the, there are all of these the organizations out there that are raising money, searching for the cure to cancer. And, you know, I do applaud them for their work. But on the other hand, we know what causes cancer. What is this looking for the cure for cancer? The, we know what causes cancer. We know what causes cancer from the in your environment. We know there are over 367 different isolated elements in your environment that we know are carcinogenic. So we know what causes cancer, and we know how those things alter your DNA that then cause the whole cancer process, even to the to the viewpoint of what happens with your pH. So, I mean, we're, we're looking for, again, it goes back to the, the unfortunate viewpoint that we have in america is they're looking for the magic bullet yeah and i don't mean the one i don't mean the one from from dallas in 1963 they're looking for that magic mm-hmm. bullet that pill that is just going to instantaneously like you're in star trek make the disease go away and we're not we don't have that technology now but we do know what causes it so we are in a position where we can't avoid the things that cause cancer yeah I, you know i'm in a unusual position where uh, my company has a unique nutrition product. We sell an aloe vera and people will consume it for its anti-cancer benefits. Mm -hmm. Um, There are, there's plenty of research to show unique ways in which it helps fight cancer, even research that has been done by chemotherapy companies. But I still have to caution you. If you're taking this to try to kill the cancer, you're doing it no different than using it as a drug. Right. Because what you haven't done is said, why do I have cancer? And let me get rid of the cause. Because even if you were to find that magic bullet that killed all cancer, but you don't get rid of the cause, it's coming back. That's where I recommend people read the books from Holda of Holda Clark. Holda Clark was an absolute genius. And the, the media destroyed her. They made her look like a lunatic. And and a lot of it was because in her book, she actually names products. She names manufacturers. She names the the brand name, the trade names of these products that cause cancer. So they had no they had no solution other than to trash her, because if everyone was going to listen to her, these corporations would lose billions of dollars. But she actually names what causes cancer in her books. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think the information is there, and we just have to open up our eyes, pay attention, and make wise decisions in our life. All right, and don't let corporate America run your life, which is a, a key thing. Yeah, yeah. So I got a question for you, um, and I kind of know the answer, of course, but in terms that people that can understand, I have customers, I have people that follow me, people that listen to the podcast, ask questions, and they are all in search of their one thing that's causing their problems and people have these diagnoses like you know c diff and uh, SIBO and h pylori without ever really properly being diagnosed mm-hmm. and it could be something else it could be a candida infection yeah. what are some yeah. of the differences how do you tell the difference how do you get to the right diagnosis and help people normalize their gut flora First thing a person has to understand is the word dysbiosis. Dysbiosis means that you have an imbalance between the sum total or the sum aggregate of all the friendly organisms in your gut, the ones that the the health food companies are trying to sell you, as opposed to the bad ones, the, the, the microbes that are pathogenic that you pick up that cause disease. That's the first thing you have to understand. That's what dysbiosis is. Someone with dysbiosis is imbalanced. They don't have enough good flora. They have too much bad flora. So now, knowing that, the next thing you want to know is, okay, so I've got these two groups. I have good flora, I have bad flora. How do I find out what the bad flora is? How do I isolate it so I know how to properly eradicate it? Well, there you need a test. And what what I'm known, what I've been known for in this field for 40 years is a big advocate of testing 
because if you don't test, you don't know. It's, it's, it's the blind leading the blind. So if, if a person wants to find out what's happening with their gut environment, they have to do a test. Now, the best tests for the gut environment, there are two. There's the new age of stool tests that we have that are all DNA-based. And all the labs by now are doing them. Great Plains, Mosaic, Genova, Doctors Data, Diagnostic Solutions, all of the, 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 um, the key labs are doing DNA stool tests. Can, can I interrupt for a second? Um, when you say they're all doing this, how recent is DNA stool tests? I've never actually heard DNA inserted into the test because I always thought they got a sample and put it on a plate and studied under a microscope. Well, they still do that. But about maybe 15 years ago, one of the labs, whose name I forgot because they they merged now with Genova Labs, um, that lab started to introduce DNA technology. So they would look at, they would have your DNA, um, the DNA of your stool analyzed, not looking for crime scenes, but looking for, looking for microbes. So they would use the DNA of all the friendly bacteria, the harmful bacteria, parasites and whatnot to identify what was going on with your gut biome in addition to the culture and the microscope. Okay. So that's about, that's about, that started about 10, 15 years ago in its infancy. By now it's a standard in the industry. It's now an industry standard where any lab worth its salt has a stool test to offer you that is not only going to do the standard culture and the microscopy, but they're also going to do a DNA panel looking. Now what they look for in the DNA panel can vary lab to lab. You're guaranteed they're going to look for DNA of friendly bacteria and pathogens. Some of the labs also look for viruses and some other organisms. But generally, it, it they all will present a pretty good smattering of all the different microbes you could find. So that you're pretty safe in understanding what your biome is about. And then the better labs also include a whole digestive panel in there where they'll look to see your, your short chain fatty acids, how well you're digesting proteins, fibers from carbs, fibers from vegetables. They'll look at a good, a good assortment of things. So if you go to any of the labs nowadays and you do one of the, the up-to-date stool tests, you get a pretty good snapshot of your whole biome. The other way to do it, What's not stool is a urine test. It's a urine test that's called um, an organic acid test. And with this type of test, they're looking for organic acids that are produced by healthy organisms and bad. Same kind of idea as the stool test. So those are the two tests somebody can do. And now they can understand what their biome is about. Okay. And are you performing these tests? Are you ordering the tests? How do you do yeah, I do them. I, I routinely do them on my patients. We also have a test that I developed many years ago, which is um, only done in my practice. It's a urine test that the person does at home. It's self-administered. We give them like this little chemistry kit. They go home with it and they take a first morning urine and they actually can run these six different tests on their urine. And this is a, this is a test we frequently use because it's less expensive than the ones I just mentioned. But it's also the person can do it at any time and get a real-time snapshot of what's happening with the activity of of parasites and harmful bacteria and candida in their body. So when I speak to a patient on a monthly basis, they usually do that test for me so I can understand what direction things are going. And there's one unique thing about that test that's not found in any other test. The test reacts to Herxheimer reactions. So if the person is on a program and they're taking antifungals or antimicrobials, if they're having die off at that time, the test is going to register the die-off. And that's a huge advantage I have in working with patients compared to other doctors using even the tests I just discussed. Those other tests don't tell you if the person's having die-off. So that that it, it makes it much easier for me to navigate what's happening with them. Okay. That's that's pretty interesting because I know a lot of people are, are afraid of that. You know, they're afraid of going in too fast and having too much die-off and too much uh, symptoms. Yeah, I would, and I would agree that's not a good thing. So... I, I yeah. would agree with that. And if, when when you read my book, The Candida Chronicles, it explains in the book how I discovered everything I learned about dysbiosis and handling candida. It takes you through all the mistakes I made, all the mistakes I learned from other doctors that they were making. And it takes you through how I learned to do it the right way, how I developed my whole technology. And then I go through, what, like, why, how do we cut back the die-off that somebody gets? How do we safeguard them? from having the die off. And I'll explain that in each chapter of the book. Yeah. Uh, and since you mentioned it, because um, a lot of people that are going to hear this are going to 
kind of have an idea how they got in their own situations. Let's talk about one of the biggest mistakes that people do in treating their dysbiosis, their uh, microflora imbalances. Traditionally, what would you say most doctors have hit that with and how have they gone wrong? The biggest mistake they make, which is one of the first discoveries I made, which is in my book in the section of axioms, is that you have to rotate antimicrobials. Everyone has heard about drug-resistant organisms, drug-resistant pathogens. I learned it the hard way, but I was conscious enough to hear what the patients were saying. Patients would come in and I would hear the same story. It would almost be verbatim. I went to the doctor. He gave me niastatin. He gave me berberine. He gave me whatever it was. And for the first couple of months, it was working. I felt better. Then all of a sudden, it stopped working. Why? Well, when I heard that enough, I went back to the medical textbooks and I learned that all of these organisms, these dysbiotic organisms are highly drug sensitive. They easily become drug resistive. They genetically mutate and become super strains or drug resistive strains. And what I learned in one particular book, Candida will jump species after about 21 days of being exposed to the same medication every day. So if you're taking niastatin, if you're taking citricidal, paramycocidin, caprylic acid, whatever it is, after 21 days of continual exposure, the mother cells of the candida organism start to impart data to the daughter cells, DNA modifications in their structure to teach them how not to be killed by this medicine anymore. So yeah. that's, where I, that's, where I came up, that's where I came up with the concept of rotation of the organisms. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, of the, uh, of the yeah. medications. You have to rotate the, the medications you're taking. And in different phases, we do them for different time periods, depending on what we're using. When we're dealing with um, substances that kill the organisms, both in the gut, but also systemically, we want to rotate them in shorter periods of time. So we do four days. So we'll typically take four different antimicrobials, have the person switch them around every four days, so 16 days would be one cycle through. We typically have them go through th uh, two cycles before we check them to see how it's going. When it comes to the, um, the substances that kill the microorganisms really deep in your intestinal tract, those we go a little longer with. We go seven days on those. And those are typically fatty acid-based um, antifungals like caprylic acid, undesalinic acid, monolaurin, they have the ability to get deep enough in your intestinal tract and actually enter the tissues because they're fatty acids and they can kill the organisms right at their root. Because candida, when you look at it under a microscope, looks like this broccoli thing hmm. and it makes these little roots. And these little roots that it forms break through your intestinal tract looking for glucose. They're looking for food. That's one mm. of the ways you develop leaky gut syndrome is the candida naturally can cause leaky gut because it can destroy the, those little interstitial spaces in your intestinal tract looking for food. So they, they bust through there just like roots growing into dirt, you see. Yeah. And yeah. Those, those fatty acids can go deep enough into your intestinal tract and get deep enough into the cells to destroy those roots where other things can't that that person might take, which which would be powdarco can't, for instance, dehebo can't. Um, th there's a whole host of antifungals which are very helpful and can work, but they can't destroy those roots. That's where the fatty acids work. Interesting. Now you mentioned treating intestinal, but you also said systemic. And what did you mean by that? Yeah, it's good. I'm glad you said that because I get in a lot of trouble with this one. I get the, one of the things I'll tell my patients very often is if you're going to go to your medical doctor and you're going to tell him that you have candida and you're being treated, you do not want to say to the doctor, I have systemic candida. You want to say, I have chronic candida, not systemic. Because when a medical doctor hears the word systemic candida, he thinks blood culture, positive for fungus. This person has fungus in their bloodstream, they're terminal. Gotcha. Because that's typically what happens. If you have systemic candida per the medical definition, it means you have a fungal infection in your bloodstream. And that only happens to end stage cancer, end stage eight, HIV or AIDS. And that mm -hmm. usually means you're terminal. Okay. So the doctor's looking at you. Here you are all dressed up in his office, <laughs> swinging your arms around. I have systemic candida. He's you're, he's going to think you're out of your mind. You're you're, yeah. you're you're nuts. You're nuts. A lot of the times when I hear people with their diagnoses, I want to ask, okay, 
what were you diagnosed with and how was this diagnosis made? Because yeah. people do get yeah. confused and it's true. Yeah, it's true. Now, they... uh, th- this candida, um, so we know it as a- an intestinal uh, imbalance, but where else can it go and what other systems or organs can be affected by it? Well, the first thing everyone has to remember is candida is normal to have in small amounts in your intestinal tract. It is actually part of your biome, but it's supposed to be a very minor part of your biome. Why it's there in the first place is that when you die, candida starts to over naturally overgrow in, in your body and it decomposes your body. This is why embalming fluid is really nothing more than a, a big antifungal that you're being given hmm. to the body. That's that's one of the 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 if we want to call that useful, I guess it depends on your mindset. But one of the fun, what the only function practically that candida has is it decomposes the body after you're dead. So it's normal to have candida there in small amounts. This is a normal thing. It's when it overgrows that it becomes a problem. Candida normally resides in your colon and your small intestine. It's more it's more apt to reside in your colon, but it can move to your small intestine when it overgrows in your colon. Now, the the lymphatic system of the body drains directly into your colon. So candida can be very sneaky. Candida can get in your lymph system and from your lymph system to your your liver, to your spleen, uh, to other areas. But candida, if you have leaky gut, can also attach itself to the red blood cells. This is where dark field analysis would come in. Someone who does something called live which is done with a dark field microscope, you can find candida attached to your blood cells. Now, that still doesn't mean you have a fungal infection in your blood. It only means that candida cells have now attached to red blood cells. But when they do that, they can hitch a ride, so to speak, through your bloodstream, and they can lodge in other areas. From being attached to the red blood cells, the candida can go to your lungs. It can go to wherever it wants to go, and it can attach itself into that organ or gland and invade the organ and gland. But you see, it's still not a fungal infection in your blood. So mm-hmm. the candida candida can go anywhere in the body if it gets bad enough. Okay. And then once once it's there, it causes uh, various malfunctions. Can't, the reason why candida is so interesting is if it, it can cause so many different problems. And it's so yeah. commonly overlooked. Yeah. So what are some of the symptoms where people might say, okay, this is this might be candida? What do people this, experience? This is along the same line I was just speaking, why it's so interesting. A person who gets candida initially feels tired. They start having brain fog. They start forgetting things. They start forgetting names. They've, they walk into the room and they forget why they're there. Um Jennifer Love Hewitt posted something very funny on Instagram about this the other day. The geriatric GPS, it not only tells you where you're going, but it reminds you why you went. (laughs) But this is what happens to patients with candida. This is what happens with them. Now, as candida advances further, the person starts to become allergic. They start having food reactions. They start getting bloating, gas, constipation, diarrhea. It depends on their biome what's going to happen. But they have a lot of GI problems, and they can start getting skin rashes. Now, if we just stop at this point, most people aren't going to connect a skin rash to their bloating and gas. That's what makes candida so sneaky. And then as candida continues to advance, it can cause rheumatoid arthritis. It can, when it starts to cause leaky gut, now you become chemically reactive. You can't tolerate any kind of chemical in your environment. In the old days, we used to call this a universal reactor, somebody who literally can't leave their house because once they go outside, auto fumes, industrial fumes, all these things cause so many reactions that they can't tolerate it. They can't go to the supermarket and walk down the aisle where all the cleaning solutions are. They can't do that. Now, now a person who is in that shape is not going to think their farting has anything to do with that, you see. Right. And that's why candida can be so interesting. You can get arthritic pains. You can have all kinds of autoimmune. You can get Hashimoto's. You can have multiple sclerosis. You can have lupus. You can have all of these autoimmune conditions that are caused by candida. And the doctors don't, doctors don't know this. Doctors think, well, of course, you know, they're myopic. So they tend to think, you know, you have Hashimoto's. Well, that's, that's that. And that has nothing to do with anything Mm. else. But if you look at how Hashimoto's would start, 
Hashimoto's typically starts, the person has chronic candida, they develop leaky gut, the candida invades their thyroid, and if you really look further, you'll find that that person very often is mercury toxic, and mercury has an affinity for storing in the thyroid gland. So here you have, you're perfectly set up to develop autoimmune in your thyroid, and we call it Hashimoto's. That's the name we give it. Yeah. You know, it's but interesting you say that because, you know, we didn't have as much chemistry in our diets uh, 30 years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I guess I, GMO started becoming popular in what, maybe the 80s, I think. Yeah, and, yeah late, late 70s, 80s. And essentially, you know, a GMO is essentially a food that is laced with antibiotics inherently because it almost makes its own pesticides and tolerates all the herbicides. Right. Uh, so now they're filled with chemistry. And we started making more packaged foods and preserved foods and things that last longer on the shelf. And we're bombarding ourselves with all of this chemistry. Um, terms like dysbiosis and all the microflora imbalances have become more and more popular, as has something you just mentioned, thyroid disease. Mm -hmm. It seems like 30 years ago, you know, we didn't talk about thyroid disease that much. Not that many people were struggling with Hashimoto's or other thyroid issues. I wonder if that's the well, this, connection. This is why I have three websites. I have my main website, which is health-truth.com, where I talk about everything. I have the New York City Candida Doctor, where I spe specially talk about Candida. And I have the New York City Thyroid Doctor website, because Candida and thyroid are just so related. When you're dealing with a Candida patient, when you clear up his Candida and you clear up his biome and you get his flora restored, the next thing you're going to run into is that this guy has adrenal thyroid dysfunction. It candida causes adrenal thyroid dysfunction in people. Hmm. And along the line that you just you're talking about with, with chemistry, well, if you think about it, autism, autism has been increasing since well, first since we were able to identify it and categorize it and label it, it's increasing. But there's two reasons why. The bad reason why autism is increasing is because schools get a kickback from the federal government for having autistic children and having to put them in special classes. Hmm. That's the autism is increased. The true reason why it's increased is because we're better able now to identify children who are compromised from a, a viewpoint of clinical ecology, these, ki these kids cannot detoxify. I've treated enough of them. And I also, um, a few years ago, was um, the, uh, I, I guess you would say, the primary care physician for Jenny McCarthy's son. And I know Jenny. Jenny, Jenny actually wrote the back cover of my book, The Candida Chronicles. And when you look at these children, they were not identifiable until recently, and they were not getting autism until recently because they weren't being challenged. We know what the genetic errors are in kids who have autism that prevent them from detoxifying. 200 years ago, these kids weren't subjected to the toxins in the environment that were affecting them neurologically. They didn't exist. So these kids were fine. When you bring them up to present time in this environment that we have, now the kids are getting hit with thimerosal from vaccines. So they're getting mercury, copper um, toxicity from the vaccines. Now they're getting amalgam fillings in their mouth, which are also um, another alloy of mercury and copper. Yeah. So these kids are being challenged now, and their genetic weaknesses are being challenged. So now they're displaying autism. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I heard uh, just recently, it was in, a, I think, a Twitter post or something, that one thing you don't see is autism in Amish areas. Yeah, so uh, I read that post, too. It's very, isn't it something? Which, yeah, if there's truth in that, it's like, okay, well, they do live very differently. Uh, they probably don't have mercury in their teeth, and they nope. probably don't use uh, genetically modified. And they're, uh, they're, they're anti-vaxxers. They're very much yeah. against vaccines. Yep. So it's a very good point. Yeah, you know, that it, and that's a funny topic too. We won't get into that here because the, you know, this video will get shut down. So just mentioning the word. <laughs> oh my goodness. But can I plug, I, I a, can I plug a book? Can I plug a book? 
please do. If if people want to have their minds blown within three pages of a book, buy a book written by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. The name of the book is called The Real Anthony Fauci. I just got the book last week, and I've already given like five or six people copies of the book as a present. Wow. That's all. I'll, that's all I'll say. Robert oh. F. Kennedy Jr. The book title of the book is "The Real Anthony Fauci." It will blow your mind. Yeah, yeah, and I I, I know where that's going to go already because I've listened to so much of his material. Um, he's got a well studied, brilliant mind in that area, so I know it's going to be good. But I wasn't aware of the book, so um, I'm going to read it. And in fact, on this, where below the podcast, below the YouTube video, wherever you see this, I'll make sure there's a link to that as well, so you can. It's on copy it's, on it's on Amazon. Okay, perfect. Yeah, like, perfect. A, like everything else, you know, I could talk to you for hours, and you know, and there's a lot of other things I want to discuss, like, um, and, and maybe we'll just go briefly on it, like, um, because I want to be respectful to your time. But some of the different treatments, you talked about antibiotics and you talked about antifungals. And what is the difference? How many physicians are aware of the differences? Where do people need to go to be directed to the right kind of doctors to treat their dysbiosis? Well, gee, I, I hope that all doctors know antibiotics have no effect on yeast and fungus. I hope everyone knows that. I hope all doctors know that antibiotics indiscriminately, per the Merck manual, kill bacteria, friendly bacteria, which then allows yeast and fungus to grow. So I, I would hope everybody knows that. But where people need to go is to a, a clinical nutritionist, somebody who's certified by their state, a CCN, we call them, or a CN, CNC, or a functional medical doctor. A CCN or a CNC has um, studied probably the same amount of hours as a medical doctor has, but only in terms of nutrition and naturopathic medicine. Uh, functional medical doctors have spent a lot of time on weekends taking seminars, learning all of these things that they didn't learn in medical school. Like I learned when I was in um, naturopathic school, I had about seven or eight hours of pharmacology where I learned about drug interreactions and how different drugs cause nutrient deficiencies. Doctors have hundreds and hundreds of hours of pharmacology and understanding how the drugs that they're going to prescribe suggested to them by the drug salesman who will come and right. visit them once they're in practice are going to work. Yeah. So it's quite a difference. You know, that's that's one of the reasons why I, I love the, you know, the naturopath, the uh, people that are continuing in their own study instead of being educated by the drug salesperson, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're in the books and they're studying, you know, uh, they're, they're at pubmed.gov looking up and seeing what works against what and what's the science say. Right. Um, it's a big, big difference. And, and it, it's funny, it brings up a question too, because in putting some of your bio together, I saw a term that I wasn't familiar with, and it's a doctorate of neutropathy. Mm-hmm versus naturopathy what's the mm -hmm. difference well the first of all the school doesn't exist anymore but um at the time i went to school natura there were only two naturopathic schools around most of them have been shut down by orthodox medicine now there are lots of naturopathic schools once again but um, i found a school that emphasized more nutrition which is where nutripathy came from they taught naturopathy, but they emphasized more nutrition, and they also emphasized more the interpretation and study of lab work. Okay. Um, yeah, and when when was that? Like uh, 80s? That was in the 80s. That was in the early 80s. Yeah, yeah. I, times have changed, and yeah, that's, that's neat. That's neat. So, uh, oh, one more quick question, and then... Well, a couple more questions, actually. Sure. Let's, let, <laughs> sure. When it comes to uh, the best diet, you've already mentioned a few things about where people should be getting their food. But if we were to say the type of diet that tends to be um, anti-candida, is there such a thing? Yeah. Uh, carbs and sugars feed candida. So any diet that's low in carbs and sugars is definitely going to tend to not encourage the growth of candida. That this is true. And the one thing that almost all candida diets have in common is that they're all low in sugar and starch, sugar and carbs. Yeah. 
You know, and on that topic, I actually need to do some research because the a lot of people don't know my main product, aloe vera, is uh, mucopolysaccharides. And what what's that? It's a complex carbohydrate made up of sugars. Mm-hmm. The neat thing is, and why doesn't it have any calories or very minimal? There was actually research done, I think in 1935 it was, where they put rats into ketosis and they gave them aloe vera and they stayed in ketosis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Somehow it lowers blood sugar levels in people with diabetes. And in cancer research, they found out that cancer cells will bind to it, but can't actually ingest it. And somehow mm-hmm. by not being able to release it, it seems to starve them, which yeah, is why them. the chemotherapy works better. Right. What I don't know is, is it food for candida? I don't know. No, absolutely not. Because there are, I've used that there are, um, aloe products I've used over the years and I still use as part of my treatment, which are their aloe and they're part of my candida treatment. So no, it absolutely does not feed candida for the same reasons you, same reason you just mentioned cancer and candida have a lot of similarities. Their bio, their biochemistry and how they act, their, their physiology is very similar. So if, if, if it wouldn't feed cancer, it wouldn't feed candida. Okay. All right. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. And see, I, I didn't know that, but <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, in your years, you've been doing this a long time. What are some of your favorite testimonials or transformations that you've seen in people related to what you do? Wow. Um, well, I have to say one of them, the one that just jumps to mind was a, back in the nineties, I had a, a a daughter brought in her mother and her mother. I never saw anybody who was completely covered with a rash before. And her entire every I think every every centimeter of her body had a rash hmm. that was on there. It was incredible how the how this woman was handling it. I don't I don't really know. She was constantly in ice baths to, because she was inflamed and swollen and. What we found out about this woman was that she had candida. She had candida. She had leaky gut, and it was pretty bad. But her gen- her genetics were terrible. She was a really bad detoxifier. When we tested her hair, she had astronomical levels of copper and mercury and other toxic metals. So we just standardly put her through the program. We just put her through the protocol as it is in the book, standardly. And within six months, the rash was gone. Wow. But that one really comes to mind because I just never saw anybody like that who was so covered. Yeah. yeah. Wow. You know, and, and it's weird too, because uh, copper can be something that's a toxicity, but it can also be a treatment, right? Yes. Yeah. Copper is unique in that copper, from a physiological standpoint, copper is essential. It's an essential element. A copper, for instance, pre- deficiencies of copper can cause very aggressive cancers, um, copper deficiency nearly causes the exact same symptoms as vitamin C deficiency because copper forms um, an enzyme, vitamin um, ascorbic acid oxidase. So it helps your body utilize vitamin C. But when it's elevated, copper is highly toxic. It, 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 it oversensitizes your estrogen receptors. It can cause estrogen-related cancers. It causes crazy things to happen with your serotonin levels, makes your mind race like nuts. Um, and it co- copper toxicity can cause arthritis, and there's a whole list of of illnesses that copper can cause. So it, the copper is kind of unique in that way, where if you're deficient in it, you're, you can have a lot of trouble. But at the same time, if you have too much, it's a legitimate toxic heavy metal, just like iron would be. Iron falls in the same category, where if if you're deficient in iron, we know you can end up with all this different pro- all these problems, especially thyroid problems. But um, iron toxicity can damage your liver. So they're, they're unique. And now copper, copper is responsible for attaching iron to the heme. Hmm. So when you're, when, you're, when you're forming hemoglobin, you have to have a copper to attach the iron to the heme particle. So mm-hmm. they're related in that way. But it's like what, this is a, a, one of the more fascinating things. I was an expert, quote unquote, Sometimes experts are people who know nothing but speak loudly about the subject. But I actually did know I actually did know something along this line. I studied with Dr. David L. Watts for many years, who's the owner of Trace Elements Inc. And I consider him the world's authority and expert truly on trace elements. 
And Dr. Watts specializes in hair and mineral analysis. And I was very lucky to learn from him very early on the interreactions that occur between nutrients. It's not what the vitamin companies tell you. You can't, if you can't just take supplements and whatever your body doesn't need just comes out. That's not entirely true. That, that's propaganda from the industry looking to sell you supplements. When you take too much vitamin C, excess vitamin C can cause you to become deficient in copper. Mm. Too much copper can cause you to become deficient in zinc. Too much iron can suppress your copper. Too much calcium can imbalance your magnesium. Too much magnesium can suppress calcium and also iron and manganese. And you can, I can go, I can, I can, I can just spew for hours about different vitamin reactions. B, B, B1, right? B1, when it was discovered, was it was a great discovery because they found that that deficiencies of B1 caused berry berry. But yet, if you take too much B1, you can get osteoporosis from excessive amounts of B1. Mm. Niacin was discovered. Niacin was found to be the remedy for pellagra. But if you take too much niacin, it can elevate your blood sugar and it could cause a copper deficiency. Um, the Brain Biocenter in Princeton, New Jersey, they did phenomenal research and they found a lot of schizophrenics were copper toxic and their remedy was niacin to bring the, to bring the copper down. But if you get too much niacin, it causes these other... So every vitamin, every nutrient that you have has synergy and an ant like an anti synergy with others. And yeah. doc in Dr. Watts's book, people can buy his book on um, Amazon. It's called Trace Elements by Dr. David L. Watts. In his book, he has a wheel, and the wheel shows all the interreactions between all the minerals, which ones are synergistic and which ones are antagonistic. That's how we learned a lot about detoxing metals in people when we learned out which nutrients were antagonistic to the toxic metals. like we, For instance, manganese, zinc, selenium, um, and vitamin C are highly antagonistic to mercury. Those elements help naturally remove mercury from your body. And okay. you, can, you can go around the wheel and he shows you all the interreactions. Well, now I'm afraid to take any vitamins. <laughs> well, you just, well this, lead, this leads me to my, to my prob one of our last topics, which is supplements. Supplements are great. People need supplements. The, the, the soil, especially the GMO foods, are so depleted in nutrients. And I can talk about that for hours, but it's, yeah. it's not something I'm going to argue with anybody about. Um, as, as far as do we need supplements, yes. We don't, you can't get enough nutrients from your food anymore. Even if you're eating organic food from the best health food store in the world, it's just not going to happen. The environment is too toxic. There are thousands and thousands of studies that show that you need a higher, much higher level of antioxidants to deal with the toxicity in your environment. However, nutrients, when you take them as supplements, are very powerful because they're isolated elements. And if you don't know how to use them, you can imbalance your body completely. When a person is looking at taking a supplement program, they have to go to a functional doctor or a clinical nutritionist and get tested to find out what you don't need as well as what you do need. Because if you take enough of what you don't need, you're going to imbalance your whole system. Yeah. No, that's good advice. That's when good I was advice. first when I was first starting out as a clinical nutritionist, I went around the neighborhood, gave my cards out to all the dentists, the chiropractors, everybody. And eventually, they refer, one of them referred me this medical doctor. The medical doctor comes in, tells me the story. He, he tells me about his prostate. He said, I had prostate problems for years. I read in the literature this new study about zinc, that zinc was good for your prostate. So I started taking 50 milligrams of zinc every day. And within about two months, my prostate problem cleared up. It was like a miracle. I said, well, that's, that's good. So I continued to take the zinc. Now my... Antennas are going up. I said, how long ago is this? Oh, it was six years ago. Hmm. So I've been taking 50 milligrams of zinc for six years, had no problem with my prostate. And then about a month ago, the prostate problem came back. And I, I'm thinking to myself, he says, I can't understand why because I've been taking the zinc. So he says, I know what I'll do. I'll take, I'll take 100 milligrams. So he took 100 milligrams and the prostate problem within two or three days went out of control to the point where he was looking for help. He ended up being referred to me. Hmm. I told him, the first thing I want you to do is stop the zinc and start taking copper. 
He says, why? Well, blah, blah, blah. So I, I explained to him a little bit, and I had him do a hair mineral analysis. He calls me, and about four days later, and he says, I don't know what, what you did. I don't know how this is working, but the prostate is fine. It just cleared up. So eventually his test came in, and I showed him how his zinc was four times higher than it should have been, and his he was zinc toxic, and he actually caused the copper deficiency. Now, if people – one thing to understand about copper as an essential element, it's responsible for – controlling bacterial infections in your body. Your thymus gland mobilizes copper and gets it into your lymph system, and the copper actually electrocutes bacteria. That's part of how your antibacterial function in your body normally occurs. So this guy suppressed his copper so low that he caused the prostate infection. Hmm. And this is the, he's the poster boy, this, this doctor, the poster child for somebody taking a myopic, a myopic view. He's going to take zinc is good for the prostate. So I'm going to take just zinc. I'm going to take it for years and years and years. I'm not going to pay any attention to the imbalances I could get by taking this one nutrient. Yeah. Yeah. Thousands of men are going to be heading to New York to get their prostates fixed now. <laughs> well, well, there's um, lots of help out there for that. <laughs> Um, you know, is there anything that you wish I asked that we should have covered in this besides the, where to go? We'll get to that as far as where what, to find what out is more. the ideal diet for men? People have been asking this question. Nutritionists have been arguing about this for years. What is man's ideal diet? Okay. The vegetarian says the ideal diet is vegetarian. The fruitarian says the ideal diet is the fruitarian diet. The carnivores say you have to eat meat. Everybody has an opinion about what the ideal diet is. And usually it's because that's what works for them. That's the yep. part they're not telling you because that's what's worked for them. Yeah. The ideal diet for man is based on a few things. First of all, there is no one ideal diet that works for everybody because everyone is biologically individual. Secondly, how do you tell where your, your genetic individuality is regarding your diet? Roger Williams talked a lot about this in some of his early books. But um, Dr. Diadamo is the one who's hit it on the head. Because your blood type genetically goes back to certain areas in this world, you first look at your blood type if you want to establish a foundation for what diet a person should take. So it boils down to, it's, it's pretty simple, but you also look at it geographically. Like I would challenge anybody to take an Eskimo out of, Alaska, bring him down to the tropics and put him on a beach and have him eat tropical fruits all day. This is going to be a disaster. His body is not used to this. You can't, and vice versa. You're not going to take somebody in the tropics who's eating papaya and and all this stuff and bring him up there and give him whale blubber to eat. It's not going to happen. <laughs> the b body genetically has adjusted to a diet, not only based on its environment and the weather, but based on time. Yeah. So you have your type O. The type O is the carnivore. A type O is supposed to be eating more of a paleo diet, the hunter-gatherer diet. The, the type O genetically comes from Africa. He comes from certain parts of Europe, especially the Germanic parts. And he's used to eating a diet that's heavy in, in meat. But the type O as a hunter-gatherer went out in a tribe hunting an animal for a few days. They ate berries. They ate nuts. They ate vegetables that they could find along the way. They capture the animal. They bring it back. They feast on the animal for a week. And then they're back on the road again. That was their diet. That's what they did for thousands of years. You see? That's why where the, the, the type O diet sometimes is called the caveman diet because that's what, that's what you had. As blood types evolved, you developed the type A. The type A is a farmer. And you find a lot of type A's. It's natural to be a type A. In, in India, you find it. In the Orient, they were farmers. So they ate a lot of grains. Their bodies are used to eating grains, eating gluten. They handle gluten better than we do. Then you have the next blood type is B. B hails from the Mediterranean, from Greece, from Italy, that whole region. And the Mediterranean diet is higher in fish, high in vegetables, it has some animal protein, but it's again, those those foods that were common to that area. The newest blood type is AB. ABs can eat a little bit of everything and be fine. So you, you start out with your blood type, then you go to a functional doctor and you get tested. You get your genetics tested, you get functional tests on how your body does with, 
well with what foods, with what nutrients, and then you put the rest of the picture together. That's how you find out the ideal diet for an individual. Start with their blood type, and then you test them. You test how fast their metabolism is, how their thyroid's functioning. You do all these tests, you get it all together, and now you have concrete, solid scientific facts that can back up what diet is going to be correct. Yeah, it's funny because it's so contrary to what we're programmed to understand as being best because people have these experiments. I was, you know, obese and I did this particular diet and now look at me or I had cancer and I did this particular diet and now look at me. And it's based on their own experience and they want to give you that dogma. That's a therapeutic diet. Okay. The person who does, the person who has cancer who goes on macrobiotics or who goes on a a juice fast or something, that's a therapeutic diet. That's not a maintenance diet. Right. There's a big difference in there between what you're going to take to maintain daily health and what you're using as a a therapy or like a therapeutic diet, as I'm saying. It's a big difference. You know, it's funny because you sound more like me than I do. Uh, You know, I like to help people understand, you know, there's a a survival of the fittest diet. Mm Mm-hmm. And there's a, I need to do this because of this situation. Right. When you're imbalanced, you often have to do something that is imbalanced itself in order to put you back in balance. If you can follow the, 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 the logic on that. But when you're basically in your body's homeostasis and you're doing, as you're saying, a survival, well, what is going to aid that survival as far as a long-term plan? That's where you have to look at your blood type. You have to look at whatever idiosyncrasies can be picked up about you through lab testing to put it all together. Yeah. This is what the doctor of the future someday will do. You'll go to him. He'll do all these functional lab tests. About He's going to check your levels of toxicity. He's going to check your nutrient levels, how, how they're functionally operating. Then he's going to look at your genetics. He's going to see what your body is genetically programmed for. He's going to put all that together, and then he's actually going to give you a program that's going to be healthy and be self-correcting. That's going to be when we enter Star Trek. Man, yeah. We're That'll not be there something. <laughs> but there is no one diet that works for everybody, and it's because of genetics like that. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned a website, um, actually a couple places to go. Tell our audience now the websites that you have, their purpose, and where they should go to find out more. Yes, my three websites, my main website is um, health-truth.com and health-truth.com contains all my data. Then there's the New York City Candida Doctor, which specializes in data on Candida. And then the New York City Thyroid Doctor, which specializes on my research into thyroid. And as, as far as thyroid goes, I've taken the work of three men and put it together which I feel gives you the biggest look at, at thyroid functions. Dr. Weston Childs, um, Dr. Rind. Dr. Rind's website is amazing because Dr. Rind is the, is the person who has completely nailed down using your body temperature to totally understand your thyroid function. And then the work of Dr. David L. Watts, who I mentioned earlier, because Dr. Watts is the one who clarified the, the thy, what we call the thyroid ratios. Which Guyton and Guyton's physiology, Guyton spoke about this. He was, he he mentioned that this existed, but didn't really understand enough about it. Doctor Watts nailed it down. We know that the ratios of calcium to potassium and zinc and copper in your tissues are the ones that determine how responsive your body is to thyroid hormones. Because how many there are so many people out there whose thyroid tests are normal, and yet they have they have every symptom in the world a low thyroid. And functional doctors go ahead and treat them with thyroid anyway, which is a step up. But between Dr. Watts and Dr. Rin, they really explained why. If you were to do a hair test on these people, you'd find that they're, they don't have, they have a problem with their cellular receptors accepting the hormone and utilizing it. And Dr. Rin will demonstrate these people have lower than normal body temperatures. Yeah. Is that Dr. Bruce Rin? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I know my audience knows him well. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had him on my show yet, but um, I, I know he's a brilliant mind. He is. Um, wow. Okay. I am going to make sure that there's links to those sources below the video on the podcast page. Um, a lot of times on the on the podcast themselves, uh, 
I know, I know you know this because you have your own podcast. And yeah. I saw that on, I think it was the health-truth.com website. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, we can't necessarily put links in those sources. It'll be just text telling people where they can go. But I'll make sure that audience, you're going to be well connected. Look below the video, look below the podcast, all the information, all those little details that you didn't get to write down. It's going to be there. Dr. Biamonte, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed speaking with you. I'd love to come back and speak with you again. Ah, We could probably do this for hours. And man, I would, I would love to do that. I'm going to take you up on it. You got a deal. I'm there. All right. Thank you. All right.